Hello everyone and welcome to Climate Australia. My name is Lee Constable and this is another episode in our series with the ARC Centre of Excellence for Climate Extremes. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I am broadcasting to you from today. I'm on the land of the Turbul and Yugara people, so I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past and present and of course acknowledge the ongoing relationship that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders to people across the First Nations that make up what we call Australia have with land, sea and sky. Speaking of all of those things, today we are talking about marine heat waves. The title today is Boiling Point, the rise of marine heat waves and their impacts. And we have three researchers from the Centre of Excellence here to talk to us about what the marine heat waves are, what's happening and has happened, and what might happen in the future as well. So I will introduce them one by one. I'll first start by introducing you to Professor Neil Holbrook. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Neil. Neil is a professor of ocean and climate dynamics. His expertise is in the ocean's role in climate ocean and climate dynamics, climate variability, extremes, and climate change. He is best known for his research on South, on South Pacific Ocean region climate change, variability, and extremes. Welcome to the show, Neil. Thanks very much, Lee. Great to have Pleased you here. To be and here. Joining Neil, we've got uh, one of his colleagues, Dr. Jules Keiter. Jules is a research fellow at the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies at the University of Tasmania. His research focuses on understanding the dynamics, evolution and predictability of marine heat waves. So welcome to the show, Jules. Thanks for having me, Lee. Oh, my pleasure. And it's also my pleasure to introduce, last but not least, Yuxing Wang. Uh, Yujin is a PhD student and she's at the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies at the University of Tasmania. Yujin's PhD is about understanding the predictability of marine heat waves using linear inverse models. So I really am excited to hear about that. And of course, it's great to have uh, your expertise here as well, Yujin, as we are looking at not just what has happened, but what will happen and how we figure that out. So we'll start by setting the scene uh, with you, Neil. Uh, could you explain first, what is a marine heat wave? Well, that's a good question, Lee. Um, really, I guess we, we, can, we all think about what an atmospheric heat wave is. You know, we have a few days of uh, much warmer weather or hotter weather um, in a row. Um, a few days in a row like that, and uh, we're familiar with that. And if, if it's like an extreme for a longer period of time, <clears throat> we, we're familiar with that as a, as a heat wave. Well, in the ocean, they're very similar. You know, um, you get the same sort of thing. You get uh, warmer, much hotter waters um, than would, you would normally feel, uh, what would normally be um, at that particular location. And, um, and that puts stress on uh, marine species, just like uh, we feel in the atmosphere. We get stress on our bodies, um, heat stress. And, and really, that's really, I guess, what marine heat wave is, is about. Yeah, and I think a lot of people have been learning only very recently that this is a phenomenon that occurs. We're more than familiar with heat waves on land that we experience and have to prepare for. Neil, how long have climate scientists been aware of marine heat waves? Well, I guess we've been familiar with um, hot hot um, water um, or warmer water for m multiple days in a row, but it was really only in 20, 2011 when there was this big marine heat wave off Western Australia, um, which uh, later got called the Ningaloo Nino um, marine heat wave. And uh, that was um, identified as a very, very big, extensive um, uh, blob of warm water off the Western Australian coast. It had devastating impacts on um, kelp species. There were species of um, fish that were seen that they hadn't seen before. Um, kelp died. There was seagrass in uh, Shark Bay in the uh, western um, tip of uh, Western Australia that died about, um, I think, about 36 to 40 percent of the seagrass were um, uh, affected um, and uh, and the recovery of um, all of those things has been quite slow. Um, many things haven't actually um, recovered and it really I guess 
from that point in time, the marine heat wave um, language really got coined. And there's been then a lot of excitement around trying to understand um, uh, how marine heat waves, um, uh, I guess, are formed, um, why, when they might uh, disappear, and understanding potentially how they might change in the future. Yeah, and I mean, what they do to the environment is very interesting. You mentioned new species emerging and things like that. There can be uh, more devastation, obviously, on different species. I wanted to turn to you, Jules, just to ask about impacts um, and what you've found, particularly talking to, um, you know, people in the fishing industry and other stakeholders. Yeah, so marine uh, heat waves can ecology and environment in, in a number of different ways. Uh, sorry, I just realised my internet's breaking up a little bit. I'm hope, hoping that's okay. Um, you can just start so, again, maybe, Jules. We only lost you for a second. Sure. Yeah. So so I was just saying that marine heat waves can impact the, uh, the local ecology and marine environment in a number of different ways. So Neil's already alluded to these impacts on, uh, say, kelp and seagrass in, in uh, Western Australia. There was another major marine heat wave in the uh, the North East Pacific Ocean off the Pacific coast of the uh, of North America uh, back in 2014-15. So that particular event was quite a long lived marine heat wave lasting around about two years, um, which which is actually another point to to stress about marine heat waves and their difference with atmospheric events. They can be really long lived. So we tend and, to think of. Sorry, Jules, was that the one they called the Blob? Exactly, yeah. So that, that that was the event affectionately dubbed the Blob, um, received a lot of attention. Um, that, that particular event caused, you know, massive die-off of fish, uh, seabirds as a result, sea lions. So really a, quite a dramatic change in the environment. Um, we've, we've also been looking, for example, around Tasmania um, on the impacts of marine heat waves to, to things like oysters and abalone and salmon. So in oysters, for example, we know that uh, extremely warm temperatures can trigger a disease known as Pacific Oyster Mortality Syndrome, or POMS. Um, they can... Oh, we just lost you there um, after explaining uh, uh, POMS failure. to us. So maybe if you just go to Sorry. after you said that bit. Yeah, so POMS is a, uh, a temperature triggered um, uh, virus uh, in, in oysters. We've also looked at impacts on abalone, um, they can cause weakness in abalone and, and a reproductive failure, sometimes mortality. Uh, they've, they've also impacted the salmon industry. So marine heat waves, for example, warmer, warmer temperatures can, can reduce the rate of feed conversion into growth in salmon. Um, so there, there are a whole range of impacts, coral bleaching and, and so on. And Neil, from your perspective, how do you kind of measure these things or what are, without going into obviously what Yushin's going to talk about soon, how do you measure these things and what are some of the big challenges? Well, one of the ways that um, we get a, a more global perspective of um, temperature change and uh, potential marine heat waves is really from satellite remote sensing um, of sea surface temperatures. So um, there's a pretty wonderful um, observing system of satellite now um, and with, I guess, sea surface temperature records um, back to the early 1980s. So we've got, you know, close to 40 years of um, satellite um, sensed sea surface temperatures. And so that that's really good then to try and understand temperature change at the sea surface. But if you want to look at marine heat waves below the surface, you need something else. Um, and so Things like um, autonomous floats and moorings, there's things like Argo floats, they call them, that, that float around. That makes it a little bit more complicated because they move around in currents and to try to understand how temperatures change at a particular location needs a bit of thought. Um, but the other thing you can do, um, it's not really measuring, it's just understanding the ocean and how changes are from models. Yeah, and Yushin, I wanted to bring you in at this point because your research is really important when it comes to what Neil just mentioned, uh, understanding from models. And Neil also mentioned Ningaloo Nino. Nino, yeah. Yeah. Could you explain to everyone what Ningaloo Nino is? Uh, Ningaloo Nino is actually a 
uh, called the marine heat waves um, happens over the Western Australia coast. And it's, um, it is kind of a recurrent marine heat waves there and in recent decades and caused like um, the extension, extended uh, car bleaching and uh, the kelp forest kill. Um, yes. And, yeah, I, and I, I think kelp forests are really important, aren't they, for the broader ecosystem? Yeah, that's it. That is correct. And I am actually looking at the um, predictability of marine heat waves there. But the, you know, the predictability of marine heat wave and the prediction is actually in, in its early stage and it's inadequate and almost nothing there. So, but people has um, uh, realized and it has checked and more, more and more attentions and considerations recently. Because um, as Neil Andrew said, marine heat waves can have many negative impacts and people start to realize if we want to reduce those, um, you know, devastating consequences. So the understanding the predictability and try to like, like develop a skillful prediction system is very important. Yeah, so that's what your research is really trying to do, isn't it? It's like you said, there's not been um, much before, but now you can hopefully start to draw some lines between events and other factors. Is How are you uh, tackling this, this question about predictability? Um, I am actually, uh, I was building in my own dynamic model based on the um, observed ocean temperature record to try to find uh, whether some like climate variabilities or ocean circulations could be the common and um, reliable pre precursors for the historical Ningu, uh, Nino events and then provide predictability. Um, so the climate variabilities can have like uh, longer time scale persistent and propagation. So I'm really focusing on the uh, longer time predictability of Ningu Nino, like few months to up to like two years predictability. And based on my current findings, um, I found the climate variabilities in the Pacific Ocean, like the ENSO, could potentially provide several months um, predictability for Ningu Nino. And the climate variabilities in like Indian Ocean could even provide, uh, provide longer predictability. Wow. So, I mean, for those not from Australia who might be watching, Ningaloo is over on in Western Australia, and we think of Enzo, the Pacific, on the eastern side of Australia. Um, did did you expect? I mean, it's surprising to me as a non-climate scientist, but um, you know, did you expect those things to have such a link? Yeah, yeah, definitely, because it's have like um, some, because uh, like Enso events could have bring some um, the warm water from the equatorial region to the Western Australia coast. It's like through the ocean circulations and bring the warm water to the WA, uh, Western Australia coast and the marine heat wave happened. Mm -hmm. And does that go under Australia up the West coast or the other way? The, the warmer water to to the western side. Uh, it's just uh, some La Nina like insel events can enhance the like the transport of the warm water to the WA coast and that's it. Wow. So interesting. So it's obviously there's no shortage of work for you to do on on these huge these huge questions, which you know I'm sure will span far beyond a PhD project. <laughs> um, so Jules and Neil, I was wondering if you could comment on some of the other um, examples of Australian heat wave, marine heat waves we've had, um, for instance, in the Great Barrier Reef. I'm happy to talk to this one, Neil. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the, the Great Barrier Reef is is uh, kind of a, obviously, a, 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 as we know, a kind of sensitive and, and delicate, pristine environment. Um, it's experienced a number of marine heat waves in recent years. Since uh, 2015, the uh, the Bureau of Meteorology reports that there are actually there have actually been three mass coral bleaching events uh, in in those few short years. Um, one thing that um, I find kind of scary, and and so Neil alluded to this, and and you should have talked about this 2011 Western Australian marine heat wave, which which had a really huge impact on that environment there, and really was a kind of step change. In the, in the environment. Um, 
so that that marine heat wave that occurred there was was classed as a category four marine heat wave so we have this categorization system for marine heat waves that one was a category four the great barrier reef even though the coral sea um you know has experienced these marine heat waves it's yet to experience anything on a widespread scale that's approaching category three so it hasn't had category four barely experienced category three i mean it's just uh it's scary to think that you know the de the devastation that a category four marine heat wave would would have on, on that environment. Yeah. Um, uh, so other other areas that I've been uh, focusing my attention on is is around Tasmania as well. So there have been two major marine heat waves there in recent years, in the summers of 2015, 16, and 17, 18. Uh, the 2015, 16 event was quite a long event, uh, so 300 days in duration. Um, the 2017-18 was slightly more intense, but uh, uh, shorter duration. So yeah, there, there's a there's a number of examples of these events, and and um, more and more work is being done to link those two impacts. So when we think of heat waves on land, they might last for days, but when we're talking heat waves in the ocean, they're lasting for, I mean, almost a year in that example you yep. just gave. Wow. And um, and I know that uh, kelp forests have really been impacted greatly. I was wondering if you'd like to um, let people know about the the heat waves that you've seen in the areas around Tasmania and the effect that that's had. Yeah, so this this is not actually my area of expertise in terms of the kelp, though, though I am quite aware that a lot of kelp has been wiped out from, from around Tasmania. However, I saw, I saw this story just earlier this week, actually, where uh, they've they've started to grow kelp in the lab and and reseed it back into the environment and um, had huge success with uh, with it growing again. And it can grow quite rapidly. So That's it seems news. like there's some possibilities for reseeding with with the research going on. Yeah, great. Um, now. Neil, I wanted to ask you about what's next. Uh, obviously, we've had the the IPCC report of the physical science um, of climate change, and you know, marine heat waves was one thing mentioned in that. We're leading up to COP, so a lot of people are thinking about the future and targets and things like that. What do we know about the potential ways that marine heat waves might respond to different? Uh, levels of warming in the future well um there's a there's quite a close association between um increases long-term increases in sea surface temperature or ocean temperatures in general so whether it's through the whole water column um, and marine heat wave um, incidents so we think about metrics of marine heat waves in terms of frequency intensity and duration and all of those factors are basically increasing with climate change. So as sea surface temperatures warm, you know, the frequency, intensity and duration of marine heat waves is basically increasing. Um, we've seen over the last 100 years or so an increase in the number of marine heat wave days at any location on average of about um, one and a half times. So about half as much again. Um, and we, the, the, basically this is projected to uh, continue into the future and we're really um, in effect tied to um, our projection pathways depending on how much greenhouse gases I guess we put into the atmosphere. So going forward it's going to be really important to uh, mitigate um, and re reduce uh, those emissions in order to try to reduce the impact on marine heat wave um, likelihood and intensity going forward into the future. Yeah, I, I think it's um, it's something obviously people are going to be looking to work like Eugene, what you're doing to try and help predict what what sort of um, what sort of benefit could it have if we're able to better predict heat waves in the future? Uh, so I guess the biggest benefit is uh, the marine heat wave predictability or potentially pre uh, prediction system could allow people to take actions in, in advance before marine heat waves when they see like a precursor of marine heat wave signal to avoid the losses and caused by 
uh, marine heat waves. For example, like um, for agriculture, if we can get like short term um, marine heat wave prediction in few days to few weeks and could uh, allow people to take short term action to those farm species in agriculture industries and um, that would like uh, the species that would like suffer uh, mortalities and the marine heat waves and you can like relocate them or something like that. And if we can get longer time scale uh, forecast like um, months to years, it can provide some guidance for the agriculture and fishery management decision. Like if we can predict uh, there will be a more frequent marine heat waves events in the next year, then we probably suggest can suggest the fishery industries to change their like targeted species to those species that have high tolerance to the warm water. Yeah, yeah wow. That's that I can see why that would have huge impacts um, on people's lives and livelihoods as well as the, the ecosystems themselves. Jules, mm -hmm. what, what have you found from talking to people in the industry? Are are they really concerned about their futures with, with marine heat waves? Yeah. And I mean, there's a lot already going on, I think, in the industry for, for preparing for these. The, the oyster industry is, you know, well aware of the changes that they're seeing, for example, in, in Tasmania. Um, they're already doing things like selective breeding for, for this, this virus that I talked about, POMS. Um, and, yeah, just as, as Yushin says, if, if, if we had kind of seasonal forecasting capacity for these marine heat waves, I think it would be hugely beneficial to to these to the planning for these industries just even on a seasonal scale so again coming back to the oyster example that on on the very short term that they can they can do things like bringing the oysters out of the water or pushing them to deep, deeper depths depths to avoid some of those impacts um and uh yeah there, there's a range of other things for example uh sa the salmon industry can can alter their harvest practices if they if they know that um, the, the season might be warmer than usual. So just like farmers, I think, can prepare for the upcoming season if they know that there's going to be more or less rainfall, um, th th this understanding of what, what the next season or, or few years might be would be beneficial. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously uh, it has huge implications for um, food security. Um, I also wanted to ask... Uh, what is the applicability of what we learn about the Australian uh, marine heat waves to the rest of the world? Is it going to be something where it's like, ah, oh, that makes sense for that part of the world, but we need totally different models? Or are there shared uh, understandings between the different areas? Did you want me to have a go at that? Yeah, go for it, Neil. Um, so, so there. I mean, I think one of the things that we haven't really talked about are the key drivers, um, I guess, of marine heat waves. Um, and in the context of what Fuxing was particularly talking about, you know, these shorter time scale um, predictions rather than long term projections. So the key things that really um, cause marine heat waves that we tend to think about are basically just enhanced solar um, heating, like you know, basically like clear sky days, um, a high, big high pressure cell and, um, you know, extra heating of the surface ocean. So that would heat the upper ocean more than it would normally feel, let's say. And the other thing is through ocean currents. So in these what we call boundary current regions, um, let's say off the East Australian coast or off the Western Australian coast, you know, there's influences there basically from just, um, you know, an atmospheric heat wave or a very, very hot days over a few days um, heating the ocean surface, but also an intensification of uh, either of those currents, let's say. And these have similar um, ap applications in different parts of the world, if, you know, I guess away from the centre of ocean basins. The benefit of, of understanding those is how it's tied back to large scale climate, we call them climate modes. So they're understanding patterns of variability um, across the globe. And, and uh, those climate modes, things like El Nino Southern Oscillation, if people have heard of that as an example, um, they, they have some predictability as well. So, so then we start to think about um, predictability on 
well, we think about a high pressure system that might be just a few days in advance. So there might be short time scale predictability there. But these large scale climate modes can have predictability on longer time scales and influence through ocean circulation on much longer time scales. So the ocean then becomes an important factor then in predictability on time scales of months to um, multiple months to even a year. Whereas, um, let's say, the weather, which is much more random, let's say, and shorter time scale, might have predictability on days to a week or so. And it's just combining all that information that, that gives you um, that we can potentially build these um, predictive models that we're um, aiming to do. Yeah, well, it's great to know that uh, we've got researchers working on this in our local area, especially given how good by sea we are. Um, but it's it's also important, I suppose, for the whole global community of climate scientists, given that everything's related, you know, in this in this climate, you know, nothing is separate from the other impacts and, and factors. So uh, basically, we're going to I'll give you all one more question and then what we're going to do is go to some credits and come back and, and take a few questions, just some rain coming down here <laughs> as I say that. Um, so I might go around uh, one by one and maybe if you can tell people one thing that um, you'd like them to take away from this or learn more about um, if they're interested in marine heat waves, whether they're policy people, or business people, or everyday people who love a bit of seafood. <laughs> Neil, I might start with you. Well, I think if you're um, a policy person or a any stakeholder in industry, um, government or whatever, that's uh, needs to understand um, marine heat waves and, and the impact uh, on society, um, we do really need to improve uh, our understanding of predictability and prediction systems. Um, and one of the ways that we really need to uh, do that is to better understand the drivers um, and the timescales of those drivers um, that um, uh, give us that potential predictability. That would be my take on it. Yeah, plenty of um, good justification for all of the, the questions that you're all trying to answer at CLEX. Jules, would you like to go next? Uh, so one of the pieces of work that I've been involved with is looking at projections of marine heat waves going out to the end of the century over the, the next several decades and beyond. And one of the things that we've kind of found is that, you know, we, we kind of have a choice here. If, if we follow something like a kind of a low end emissions scenarios tra trajectory, these marine heat waves that we're experiencing today will be kind of of the same order of, of frequency of occurrence in, in future going out over the next few decades. But under a high emission scenario, the, the future is starkly different. Uh, you know, the, these marine heat wave conditions will become a new normal. And, and I think we have a choice there. Um, the science shows the two options. And um, I think for me, at least, the, the choice is pretty clear. Yeah, we um, then I suppose, like you said, it will be the new normal. We'll end up having cool waves rather than heat waves, I suppose, under that scenario. <laughs> Very good. Yuxin, last but not least. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I guess the take home message from me is uh, probably um, the marine heat wave predictability and the uh, skillful prediction system are still um, at their initial stage. Although the marine heat wave prediction is not a very easy picture, but we can start with um, understanding the predictability of marine heat wave at first, like find the reliable precursors from various sources and keeping uh, keep adding the value to the marine heat wave prediction system. And that is worthwhile and this really benefits the real world, especially the marine conservations, marine ecosystem, fisheries and agriculture. Yeah, and it's great to know that there are people like you who are looking into these things right now. Thank you all so much uh, for joining me on this episode to do, I mean, pun totally intended because I'm headed right for it, but a deep dive into marine heat waves. Really appreciate it. Um, I encourage anyone who's been watching to check out uh, the CLEX website that's been coming up on screen and check out the, the research done by the Centre of Excellence and, of course, our three guest researchers here today on, to, on marine heat waves. Thank you all so much. Pleasure. Thanks awesome. very much. We'll go to some credit.
we're back and we've got some questions to, for you all to answer. Uh, oh, there, there's a few here. What makes marine heat waves and their intensity and length so difficult to predict? Um, Eugene, you've probably touched on this a little bit. Would you like to expand? Yes, sure. Um, so I guess the biggest challenge for like the predictability um, is I, I, I think it's actually the, to, the, the biggest challenge is to contrast, uh, construct a skillful rain heat wave prediction system. So it, it is not easy to combine like different predictabilities from different physical drivers of marine heat wave to really build a strong prediction system. Even the marine heat wave in the you know, the same location, but happen at different times, may be driven by different mechanism. And different mechanism has different weight of influence to the occurrences of marine heat waves. So it is hard to quantify. And another thing is, um, although many previous studies have tried to understand um, the physical mechanism and physical drivers of marine heat waves, are they kind of the comprehensive understanding or there are still some mechanism of marine heat waves that haven't been examined so this could also influence the quality of marine heat wave prediction system and influence the influence predicting the intensity and duration of frequency of marine heat waves yeah it's so interesting that you say like different times of years so a marine heat wave that is initiated i guess in winter the summer might happen for very different reasons is that yeah because uh so the uh, mechanism of marine heat waves are varying for different marine heat waves and for uh, at different locations but some of them as new andrew said like maybe come from the solar radiation maybe come from the atmospheric driver and some of the marine heat waves make um like need, initiate by the uh, ocean circulations and climate variabilities. So, yeah. yeah, that's that's so so interesting and it's so it's so complex. I mean, I can I'm preaching to the choir here. You're like, tell me about it, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, if only if it was it was simple. Um, so, marine heat wave precursors. Um, this is a, another question I've got here. Seem to be very similar to drought precursors. Do marine heat waves behave more like drought than heat waves and with a similar environmental impacts except un underwater? And I suppose that goes to that whole longevity of, of a marine heat wave and a drought. Neil, did you have an answer to that one? Um, probably not a very good answer, but um, <laughs> the types of precursors that you think about in the ocean is like how deep the mixed layer is. Um, so in the upper ocean, uh, we have what's called a mixed layer where um, it's uh, it's well mixed down to a certain level, usually from wave action, um, cooling, it could be at the surface um, and so on. And if that mixed layer is uh, deep or shallow, it can be a precursor then to um, how it might respond to a warming event from the surface, let's say. So if it's a shallow mixed layer, for example, it's going to be more easily heated. So that might be a precursor to a marine heat wave event. And the type of things that I guess Yushin was just talking about too, those time scales, um, you know, the short weather type things. When, when we think about weather forecasts, we think about, you know, weather forecasts out to maybe seven days and then it goes off into, um, you know, more chaotic. Um, it's very difficult. But there's kind of two time scales that we think of you know one is kind of the weather time scale and the other is more like the climate time scale and there's predictability on all of these time scales that kind of uh, play in play into this that make things complicated so you might have a weather event that could actually enhance or reduce that likelihood of an event happening and i think this is where the predictability gets complicated um, whether your precursors are in place or not and uh, i was just wondering you know given that um given that the water obviously has reacts totally different with temperature and retains temperature in a different way to air um you know does that mean that it's harder to does that make it harder to end a marine heat wave you know it does is it one of those things where you know once you've got it in motion it just a positive feedback loop continues yeah, so the atmosphere is very fast by comparison with the ocean. The ocean, I always feel like it's quite sluggish. 
um, but but it has this uh, because it has this kind of thermal inertia as well. It's difficult to heat it up, um, and it's very slow to release that heat as well. So, the temperature changes that you feel in the ocean tend to be much less. So you have to actually uh, uh, provide a huge amount of heat to increase the temperature by just a, a part of a degree. Um, so you're right, yeah, it's it's um, it's much slower. It's harder to um, heat it up. It's harder to lose that heat, and the time scales then are much longer. Yeah, I've got a question here. Andrew Watkins has been watching on Simpatico. First, he says, "Ah, I missed the first half hour due to a meeting conflict." Don't worry, Andrew. You'll be able to watch it back um, afterwards. Anything you missed. Um, but he goes on with a couple of questions here. Firstly, would it be possible for us to have a marine heatwave? early warning service uh, for Australia. Now, I know that we've we've mentioned a bit about this. Um, Yushin, maybe you'd like to, to have, how far do you think we are, Yushin, with a, an early warning service for Australia on marine heat waves? Oh, as I said, prediction, marine heat wave prediction is, a, is not an easy work. And I don't know, probably Neil could add some additional information. Yeah. So yeah. what? What I can comment on is there is actually a marine heatwave prediction system being developed currently uh, at the Bureau of Meteorology in, in conjunction with CSIRO. Um, it's very early stages, and I think they've got probably about a three-year plan around that. So they're building on the um, Access S model, they called it. Um, it's the seasonal, sub-seasonal to seasonal prediction model. But they're actually going to really focus on marine heatwave predictability or pr prediction in, in that model. So um, I think it's, it's on the uh, horizon. Um, and uh, I think they're, uh, they're very hopeful that they're going to be able to do this. But this would be one of the first uh, systems probably that's um, run, glo well, uh, across the globe, um, really ambitiously trying to predict marine heat waves. Yeah, and obviously the results of your research um, will be feeding into that and helping to make it more accurate with time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things really that the Centre of Excellence for Climate Extremes is really trying to do is better understand that predictability. So if we can improve the predictability and how that predictability will potentially improve prediction systems, we're actually trying to work co uh, collaboratively with the Bureau of Meteorology and uh, CSIRO to improve those systems. Um, Andrew's second part of the question uh, is probably already answers. I noted this, that he's already said Yahoo while you were talking. Very excited, obviously, <laughs> which is great. He said, and can you talk about the skill of predicting marine heat waves, particularly in areas with coral or kelp? Um, I suppose that this would all be relevant for, for those areas of coral and kelp, wouldn't it? And definitely used by the people you work with, Jules. Yeah. I. Um... Coming back to the question, it's um, it's probably as as Neil says, it's probably early days for these prediction systems, and I know that they they do kind of uh, they're constantly assessing the the kind of skill of these models and how, and how they might be improved. Um, yeah, I I don't think I can comment too much on on how well they've got the the prediction system at the moment, but I know that that's um always part of what they're looking at. Yeah, and. And also noting as at the start of this um, discussion, we talked about how marine heat waves themselves have only been something really looked deeply into for a decade. So it makes sense that the predictability and, and other things that we might be further along with in terms of other other um, weather and climate events might be might be, you know, taking some time. Um, hence why you're researching these things, <laughs> correct? Yeah, I think the, predict the predictability in, in different regions is going to vary quite substantially based on the kind of drivers that really affect those areas. The mm -hmm. thing with coral coral reefs is the kind the the um, currently the uh, definition that we use for a marine heat wave is a little bit different than what's actually used for uh, coral bleaching. So they tend to think about you know sea surface temperatures like one degree above the maximum um, summertime value. Um, and so their coral reef bleaching um, forecasts are done under a kind of a different um, uh, system, I guess. Um, but I think that's actually being also thought about a bit further as well. Um, but, you know, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I think just, just I guess, reiterating that, um, you know, we, we're uh, really 
trying to understand, I guess, drivers on different time scales, there's going to be potential um, predictability from all different uh, factors, whether it be from, you know, atmospheric um, means from high pressure cells that are going to be very short time scale to those that are much more oceanic in nature. And uh, if we can draw from the ocean side of it, we're likely to get longer time scale predictability. Yeah, yeah. And I, I picking up on something you just mentioned there about different regions. Um, so you also mean different regions of the Australian uh, yeah. coastline will have um, be able to predict a bit easier than others. Could you expand on on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so, for example, the Tasman Sea, um, which is, you know, southeast Australia between um, Tasmania, southeast Australia and uh, New Zealand, compared with the Western Australian coast. Early on in the interview, you um, alluded to the fact that um, El Nino Southern Oscillation, for example, and so um, it seems a bit odd that uh, we might get predictability in, in the Indian Ocean region off Western mm. Australia. Well, it's kind of uh, fascinating that in, in the ocean world, it's actually a, a a pathway for flows um, and uh, propagating waves that go from the Pacific Ocean into the Indian Ocean. And the predictability from uh, what we call ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation off Western Australia is actually much higher than it is in the Tasman Sea. Tasman Sea, really, the pathway is more from the interior of the South Pacific and uh, connect connecting that information down from the tropics is actually a bit more complicated. And so the relationship with El, El Nino Southern Oscillation off in the Tasman Sea is actually much weaker than it is in the, off Western Australia, which probably comes as a surprise to a lot of people. Yeah, it definitely seems counterintuitive if yeah. you're outside of the field and, and don't know as much yeah. about it. Um, what about um, zooming out from Australia to the world? Are there areas in in the world that are much more susceptible than others in a similar way or different? Yeah, so there are, you know, I, I hate to use the term hotspots where marine heat waves are probably, you know, have characteristic um, shapes and, um, and the way that they kind of uh, might reappear. So there's been looking at marine heat waves off the California coast. There's been this blob that you talked about in the Northeast Pacific, which is very extensive, probably the biggest type of marine heat wave that's long lived um, that we see around the globe. There's been um, uh, a couple of significant events in the uh, Northwest Atlantic off the Canadian um, coast and uh, Northeast US. Um, there's been the Mediterranean marine heat wave, Mediterranean Sea, that coincided with the big heat waves, atmospheric heat waves um, in the early 2000s, 2003, when thousands of people died, um, actually in Europe, you might remember. Um, and those regions are, you know, characteristic of broader scale um, marine heat waves rather than just little, you know, changes in, say, dots or eddy, ed, eddy fields locally. And so understanding those broad events, those really iconic marine heat waves is going to be really important for us going forward. Yeah, and I suppose that when you're talking about vulnerability, there's um, the likelihood of heat waves to occur, but also then there's the likely, likely impact on ecosystems and food systems in different areas will be, be different because some populations have a higher reliance on the ocean for food than others. And yeah, there's so many different uh, factors I, I can see coming into this. Are there areas of the world where, where you think they don't have enough uh, research happening into marine heat waves or aren't getting enough support to do enough research? Well, I think, you know, the Pacific Island region, for example, um, you know, uh, vulnerable populations to sea level rise and um, and changes in um, ocean temperature that might affect things like ciguatera poisoning in uh, fish. Um, so those regions are probably uh, regions that really need to have more uh, information around um, changes in marine heat waves. Um, but any of the yeah vul more vulnerable populations, I think it's critically important. In some ways, it's really important, obviously, for let's say Australia in terms of uh, aquaculture, farming, and fisheries. But um, but around the world, um, anywhere where um, populations rely on the ocean, uh, they they probably need as much information around projections and uh, predictability to help them that they can as well. 
Yeah, and I mean, Andrew uh, Watkins again. Hi, Andrew. It's so great to have you, you chatting along with us, um, noting the 2011 marine heatwave off Western Australia being massive. Um, there's, there's another question here that links to that on why we didn't pay attention to marine heatwaves before 2011. Did they just not occur or was the impact of Ningaloo Nino so large uh, that it activated the research? Eugene, you might want to start us off with that one. Yeah, sure. Um, so the first thing, I guess, is um, so previously the marine heat wave is not that frequent and, and it's not that intense. So it didn't cause many like very devastating consequences for the ecosystem of fisheries. But since the very intense marine heat waves um, raised up in 2011, and this just raised uh, people's attentions and Oh, marine heat wave is also very important for like the ecosystem and there are many stack stakeholders that they want to know more about the heat waves and their impacts um yes i guess this is my answer yeah yeah i can definitely see why so many different stakeholders would be interested mm -hmm. Great. Well, I mean, I don't want to, I could talk to you all, all day, but I do have to let you go so you can actually get back to doing the research. But thank you all so much. Um, before we go, are there any last additions you wanted to add? I know I'm always conscious. Have I asked all the questions to get the, have I asked the questions that you want to be asked or think should be asked is always a concern of mine. Um, so yeah, add on anything else and then, and then I'll let you go about your research. Uh, maybe just one point that I could add is that, uh, you know, we, we, we've, we've talked about temperature extremes, but, you know, um, just to kind of stress, you know, we're, we're well aware that temperature changes are not kind of sole uh, influences in, in some of these examples. And, and in particular, so some of the areas that I've been looking at, for example, with salmon and abalone, we know that temperature is obviously a critical factor, but there are other factors that are important too, such as, for example, salmon um, dissolved oxygen in the water. Um, for abalone, they, they, um, they tend to like these wavy aerated conditions. And so one of the challenges is um, understanding how some of these changes over time will interact with one another. Does mm -hmm. one change offset another? Do they couple um, to, to create uh, greater impacts? Um, so it's not, um, it's not a, just a kind of one variable problem that we're thinking about here, that there's lots of other factors uh, wrapped up in it. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. And I mean, we've been talking about uh, the marine world and climate for so long uh, in this hour. And I have, you know, none of us have even mentioned acidification and all these other things that come along with it. So thank you so much for, for adding that point. It's an important one for anyone watching this back who's thinking about ocean life and ecosystems and what, what the impact might be or could be and how we might be able to mitigate and adapt. So thanks so much. Well, I will, I will call, it, uh, call it the end uh, because I, like I said, uh, I'm a question asker so I could go forever, but thank you so much again for joining me and thanks to people watching, uh, whether you're watching live or watching back, uh, thanks for, for watching and we'll be back again uh, next month and not too long with another episode uh, from the ARC Centre of Excellence for Climate Extremes. Thanks so much. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, Lee. Okay, bye, everyone. <laughs>